So good afternoon. My name is Tony Beasley. I'm the director of the US National Radio Astronomy Observatory based here in Charlottesville, Virginia. So with the support of the National Science Foundation and Associated Universities Incorporated, we build and operate radio telescopes uh, here in the US and around the world. The closest telescope is the Green Bank Telescope in Green Bank, West Virginia. It's 2.3 acres of collecting area that we can point precisely to any point in the sky. Uh, it actually has a, a great uh, tour and a, and a nice science center, so please go and visit the, the GBT. Another telescope we operate is the Very Large Array in New Mexico. This is 27 antennas set out in a Y shape with 20, arm long, 20, 20 mile long arms, and we can image the universe with this telescope. The VLA is one of the greatest scientific instruments that's ever been built, and it's a, a really, truly beautiful machine. Another instrument is the Very Long Baseline Array. This is a collection of 10 antennas distributed across the US, starting in Hawaii, across the continental US, and finishing in St. Croix in the Virgin Islands. The VLBA is capable of very high resolution observations. If there was a book on the moon giving off radio signals, we could read that book with the Very Long Baseline Array. Now today, the instrument I'm gonna to talk to you about is a new instrument. It's situated in the Atacama Desert in northern Chile, at an altitude of about 16,500 feet. It's called ALMA, the Atacama Large Millimeter and Submillimeter Array. ALMA was built over the last 10 years by an international partnership, including partners from North America, Europe, and East Asia. And today I'm going to show you what ALMA can do and talk a bit about why we build instruments like ALMA. So why do astronomy? As we've heard today, there are a lot of fantastic things that we could do with money to improve society. Uh, uh, nonetheless, uh, most cultures throughout history have had some kind of astronomy tradition. So I'll give you four answers. There are many answers. I'll give you my favorite four. The first is to find our place in the universe. As I said, most societies have had some interest in looking out into the night sky and trying to figure out where we came from. And that is part of the reason we do astronomy. The second one is the cosmic laboratory, that when we look out in the universe, what we see are places where the temperature and the gravity and the pressure and the chemistry and the physics is very different to anything that we could create here on Earth. And so by looking at these places in the universe, we can learn a lot about matter and energy in ways that we just couldn't do here on Earth. The third one is technology development, that part of building telescopes like ALMA and the other instruments I've shown you is that we develop new technologies, we develop new algorithms, new machines to do the astronomical research. And eventually, the pure knowledge and the, and the technological development from that instrumentation finds its way into your pockets today. The, the camera in your cell phone and the microwave amplifier in your phone both came from astronomy over the last 20 or 30 years. And the fourth one is STEM, science, technology, engineering, math, interest. Astronomy is a fantastic way to get kids and students and people interested in science and science-related technologies. So when I was seven years old in Australia, on a Saturday afternoon, I could sit there and I could read science fiction, I could read an astronomy textbook, I could watch a news report about people walking on the moon, and I could watch Captain Kirk flying around the galaxy in Star Trek. And it was from that that my goals, my three primary goals were set. One was to become an astronomer, another one was to walk on the moon, and the third one was to conduct a five-year mission exploring the galaxy <laughs> and kiss a lot of hot alien women. <laughs> so over the last hundred years, we've built bigger and bigger telescopes and we've moved out in the universe, and it's been humbling. Uh, in the early 1600s, we thought the Earth was the center of the universe. Uh, today, we think that the Earth is a, a planet, an average planet around an average star, in an average galaxy, in a not very remarkable place in the universe. So that is a humbling journey that we've taken in three or 400 years, a lot of that based on astronomical research. Another thing we learned over the last 100 years or so is that light, the thing that we had used for, for many, many centuries, uh, is really just part of an electromagnetic spectrum. That uh, It's a small part of the spectrum that spans from gamma rays all the way down to radio waves. And in the 1930s, we started to build radio telescopes. We wanted to see what the sky looked like at radio wavelengths. 
And this is what the sky looks like at radio wavelengths. This is projected in galactic coordinates, so the center of the galaxy is kind of the center of the diagram there. So what do you see? Well, interestingly, you don't see many stars. You see a few. What you're largely looking at are electrons that have been caused by supernovae and shocks in the interstellar medium that are spiraling in the galactic magnetic field. We also see places where stars are forming. So the galaxy is a very strong radio emitter. Most of the things around us are not necessarily. In the background here, you can kind of see it up here and down here behind the galaxy, is the radiation left over from the Big Bang. This is the Big Bang, the energy associated with the Big Bang, producing radio emission, which has traveled through time to get to us. And time is an important thing here. The speed of light is finite. When you look at the sun, you're looking at the sun as it was eight minutes ago. When you look at this radio emission, particularly around here, you're looking at the galaxy as it was about 25,000 years ago. And when you look at this radiation here, you're looking at those signals 13.7 billion years after they started their journey to your telescope. And so telescopes are time machines. We really can look back in the universe to, to understand it. Now, radio telescopes are much like the radios in your cars. You can turn the dial and you can turn the frequency up. And the image that I showed you just a moment ago is taken at frequencies which are pretty similar to your cell phones, for example. So that's why we don't build those telescopes in places where you are. We tend to build them in remote places on tops of mountains and so on. Now, we can continue to turn the dial up. So we can start to do observations at frequencies which are perhaps 100 or 1,000 times the frequency of your cell phone. And what happens at that point is we start seeing something very different. We start to see emission from the thermal properties of materials. We see the temperature of gas. We see molecules giving off radio emission. But there's a problem, which is that as those signals come down through the atmosphere, they're absorbed and distorted by water vapor and oxygen in the atmosphere. So if you want to build a large telescope to observe at those frequencies, you've got to somehow get to somewhere that's very high and very dry. So in the late 1990s, when an international group of astronomers started to think about that, what they decided to do was look around the Earth and see the best place they could find. And the answer is the South Pole. It's actually quite high, and it's an amazingly dry place. And so people thought about it, but it's actually very hard. Well, there are some telescopes. You see some great telescopes there at the South Pole. But it's very hard to run a big array there. Uh, it's very hard in terms of logistics, getting jet fuel, et cetera, et cetera. So people look for the second best place. And the second best place is the Atacama Desert of northern Chile. What we see as we zoom in here is the western side of South America. And you notice it's very dry relative to the Amazon. And as we zoom in, we come in on the Andes Mountains. And then we eventually see Alma nestled amongst these volcanoes. So there are actually two components of ALMA in Chile. There's the high side at 16,500 feet, and there's a support facility, the operation support facility, at about 9,000 feet, and they're connected by a road. So the operation support facility is the place where we do most of the thinking. There's enough oxygen there. And this is where we build the antennas, we write the software, we do all of the day-to-day -day maintenance. And we have the International Partnership has created a joint ALMA observatory led by Dr. Pierre Cox that runs the uh, operations in uh, Chile. On the left side here, you see this large blocky building. That's one of the locations where we built the antennas. We actually built the antennas on the site there, prepared them, then eventually we test them, test them at that site there, and we send them up to the high site. And I'll show you how in a moment. So we built a, a road between the two sites, about 30 kilometers of road. And it has very special properties, which you'll understand in a few minutes. Uh, that road runs from about 9,000 feet up to 16,500 feet. And eventually we get to the high site. So this is a very high place. Uh, most people have a lot of trouble up at the high site. Uh, you get headaches, you have problems with vision, and so on. So it's not a very friendly place to actually work on a day-to-day -day basis, which is why the OSF exists. Nonetheless, this is one of the best places on Earth to do millimeter radio astronomy. Here's another picture of some of the antennas. This was early on, when we had only a few antennas. You notice there are some additional concrete pads there. Well, <clears throat> in some cases, that's for more antennas to come. 
But there's another reason that we have those additional pads, which I'll explain in just a moment. There are 66 antennas in ALMA, 25 produced by the North American partner, 25 produced by Europe, and 16 produced by East Asia. To move the antennas around the site, we built a transporter. We built two of them, actually. This was a fantastic deliverable from our European partner. You see, uh, actually, in the little cabin here are where the two men are driving the transporter. So this is a large horseshoe-shaped vehicle, and it backs around the antenna like that and lifts the antenna up, and then we drive it around from pad to pad, or we drive it up from the operation support facility. So we do have to obviously bring them up from the, the, the mid-level site, but we do actually move them around on the site. And there's a little trick of radio astronomy here I have to explain to you. When all the antennas are very close together, we can make an image of a large region of sky at very low resolution. When they're very far apart, we can image a small region of sky at very high resolution. It's like a zoom lens on a camera. So depending on how far away in the universe the object you're interested in is, or how big it is, you might need a different configuration of ALMA. So there are 192 pads up on the high site for 66 antennas. And over the course of 12 to 18 months, we kind of unroll the antennas and we get different configurations. This is a larger configuration. In the largest configuration, I think some of the antennas are actually behind that mountain there. This is one of the antennas. The surface of the antenna is very accurate. It's accurate to about 25 microns RMS, which is one quarter of the width of a human hair. Now, that's very hard to do. It's also very hard to do up on this site, where the average temperature is zero degrees, and the average wind speed is 20 miles an hour. So building these antennas was a major technological challenge, and there were lots of us that didn't think it would work, and it did. So the radiation comes in from the side, bounces off this surface here, comes up to this mirror here, bounces off that mirror there, and then down through the hole in the center of the dish. Now, under the dish is the radio receiver. And it looks like this. It's actually inside a container, a metal container. Now, the reason we put them all in this container is that we actually cool them down to about minus 450 degrees Fahrenheit. And the reason we do that is when we cool the receivers down to very close to absolute zero, they become much more sensitive. So given the investment, this is a fantastic thing to do. If we look inside one of those dewars, what you see are all the different radio receivers. They're sort of built like cartridges here. So each of these different receivers you see here are actually receiving a slightly different frequency range. And this is the way that we build the receivers. Sitting behind the receiver here is a lot of electronics. We take the signal from the receiver, we digitize it, we turn it into numbers, and then we send it back to this building here, which is the Array Operations Technical Building. Now, to send the signals back is a lot of effort. Each of the antennas is producing about 120 gigabits per second of information. That's about the same amount of information as 3 million phone calls. So that's all pouring back on optical fiber. There's a network that we've buried under the ground here. And there's about 8 terabits per second coming into this high site building, which is about 8% of the total global internet traffic at any given instant, up here at 16,500 feet. So all those signals are brought back, and they're routed into this device. It's called a correlator. It was built here in Charlottesville on Ivy Road, actually. It is a very, very high-speed computer. It actually performs about 17 quadrillion calculations per second. So to put that into perspective, that's 17,000 trillion calculations per second. And it's about six times the speed of the, the fastest general-purpose supercomputer at this point. So this device was built here in Charlottesville. It has 134 million microprocessors in it, I believe. So we take the information from the antennas, we process them through this correlator, and we can produce maps of the sky, images of the sky at radio wavelengths. So here's an example. Let's look at some of the images that ALMA can produce. This is Fommelholt. It's a star, a young star, not so far away, about 25 light years. This is one of the first objects that we looked at with ALMA. What you see here on the left-hand side is the Hubble Space Telescope image. And in fact, the star's been blanked out of that. And you can kind of see this, uh, this suggestion of a ring. Well, when we observed it with ALMA, what we saw immediately was thermal emission from the dust in this ring. And this is a ring that's left over from the formation of planets in this star, ar around this star. And so in particular, what we now believe is that there's a planet just inside the ring here and just outside the ring kind of shepherding the material. 
And it's kind of the same way that Jupiter and Mars shepherd the asteroid belt in our solar system. So this is an example of the type of observation that ALMA can do for a nearby star and for distant stars. This is R. Sculpturus. This is an older star. This is perhaps uh, six or seven times the mass of the Sun. As these stars get old, they, they, they grow into what are called red giants, and they pulse. They give off big bursts of gas and dust. So about 1,800 years ago, R. Sculpturus had a thermal pulse, and it pushed this gas out into the surrounding space. And what you actually see here is the ring in uh, radio emission from the carbon monoxide molecule. And you also notice that there's this spiral that runs all the way out to the ring. So this had not really been seen in any great detail before. And what it actually implies is as the pulse happens, there's an unseen binary companion in the star that kind of winds the whole thing up and produces this spiral. This star is about 1,800 light years away. It's a fair way away. Uh, so this is a, really a lovely result. This is TW Hydra. So this is also a very, very young star. This is a star kind of about the same size as the sun, but it's only five million years old. The sun is a thousand times older, five billion years old. And what we're actually looking at here is carbon monoxide. It's the gas that comes out of the exhaust of your car, and it's frozen. And we see that the, the star would be in the hole here, and we see this disk of carbon monoxide. So what this actually is, is carbon monoxide frozen, like snow, onto dust particles and other materials that are in orbit around this star as it's forming planets. So you see here, this is the simulation of this carbon monoxide snow, and then this is more like water snow in here, and then eventually there's a, the star in the middle. So in our solar system, this line, where the snow line would be, is out near Neptune. In this uh, younger star, it's a little different. The reason this is important is that we need to know where this carbon monoxide snow line is because what happens directly in the view that we have here is comets, as they fly through this material, uh, pick up carbon monoxide. And eventually those comets crash in to planets in the inner solar system, in the inner stellar system. And this is one way that the oceans of Earth might have been seeded by organic molecules, is that you take these complex molecules in the outer stellar or solar system, they attach to comets, the comets come in and hit the planet, and that's how you deliver these materials to the surface of the Earth. So all the water in Earth's oceans probably came from comets hitting the Earth in the first billion years or so of the Earth's existence. And if they come in through the snow line here, they're actually bringing organic molecules. So you see you're touching a lot of different sciences when you, uh, when you look at some of these things. This is a result that I really like. This is gravitational lensing. What you see here is the telescope, a foreground galaxy about 2 billion light years away, and a background galaxy about 10 billion light years away. And as the light from the background galaxy comes, it arcs around the foreground galaxy, and you get these nice rings of emission. This is gravitational lensing. So this was a completely unexpected result. So there's more to come. So in some ways, ALMA is dealing with the four reasons to do astronomy. Uh, we've built new technologies, we're exploring the universe, the cosmic laboratory. The next frontier for ALMA is outreach. As I mentioned to you, as a young kid growing up in Australia, I was totally grabbed by science, and I have been propelled through my life by this subject. And I've been very fortunate to work on a project like ALMA. And so while the, the, certainly the view that ALMA produces, a different view of the universe, will have some bearing on our understanding of our role in the universe, in the long run, it could be the inspiration, getting people involved in science, producing a scientifically literate society, could be the huge difference that ALMA makes, the difference that makes a difference. Thank you.